us. We're getting to the end of Catholic class desolation. And we're going to wrap up this section just by looking at the final example again, where we introduce this complexity of the added cost due to the material construction and for the units to operate at higher temperature and pressure. So we were considering this example at the end of the class yesterday, where we were looking at this heat exchanger with a regular uh, floating head, but the difference this time was that we were making the entire heat exchanger, both the shell and the tube, to stainless steel. And we would like to operate that unit at higher pressure. So that, that was the difference from the prior example that we had seen. And we spent some time yesterday looking at this uh, table and, and using this relevant factors from this section over here. So these sections will modify the cost and increase it always. Always these multipliers will be greater than one to increase the price to account for higher temperature operation, higher pressure operation, and for more expensive materials of construction. So many, um, many units require these more expensive materials because of the corrosive environment. So those, those added costs then um, will boost the price substantially. We're going to see that again today. So we ended off the class yesterday by breaking down the cost into four components. There's the price, recall from the example yesterday, the price of the unit as is, with no modification for pressure and material of 6,200. We then said, well, if we multiply that 6,200 by the bay module factor, the 3.14, that's going to get us the price of that base unit, the, the cheaper unit with no modifications. 6,210 multiplied by 3.14, that's going to give me the price of that unit installed. But if I subtract out one multiple of 6,200, that incremental amount, so now in other words, 2.14 multiplied by the base price, that incremental amount is the cost of just installation. And that cost is going to be paid no matter whether you're installing a heat exchanger made from cheaper material or more expensive material. That those, those prices and those, those fees that you have to pay are, are unchanged. So that 13000 is going to be paid no matter what. But we also need to pay our supplier of that heat exchanger now to take their base heat exchanger model and upgrade it to handle the higher temperatures and pressure. So that means, from a practical perspective, that they're using thicker steel or uh, stainless steel in this situation to handle higher temperature and pressure. And then, of course, the, the incremental cost on their side we use the <coughs> material construction. So I believe in this example, the base unit was made from carbon steel. So to take it, that carbon steel up to 316 stainless, it's going to cost the vendor 22000 and they're going to pass that on to us. So that's, we're not going to pay 22000 we're going to pay 6200 plus 22000 to the venue. So that 6000 is for the base model plus the upgrade price of $22,000. That's the check we're going to write to the vendor uh, for supplying it to the On our side, again, we're going to have to incur some additional costs as well to install this more expensive unit. Right? We don't install the upgraded temperature and pressure and materials from the vendor onto regular materials on our end. So if we're upgrading the units, we also need to upgrade our piping, and that's what this last line accounts for. It says, well, if the vendor has paid 22000 extra on their side to upgrade the units, we're going to pay some multiple of that on our end to upgrade the piping. So take that 22100 multiplied by a piping factor, and then let's also recognize that we won't necessarily be changing all the piping in our bay model. We'll be changing most of it, so between 70% to 100% of the piping. So that's that last multiplier. So what the vendor is paying for upgrades on their side, so thicker materials of construction and more expensive materials of construction, multiplied by a piping factor, which we read off tables, I'll show you in a minute here, and then um, an additional multiplier of 70%. So we now add up those four costs that hit me 48,700. That was the cost in 1970. And then I upgraded to today's cost in a regular way. So, yes? Is size a value between 0.7 and 1, depending on how much 
you're going to the public type and you're going to upgrade in your module. So you, we usually have that knowledge from our own understanding of the process. However, if you don't know, just use the value 0.7 or make, make, use some value between 0.7 and 0.7. So those typing corrections are found off tables. Um, we had them listed here yesterday. So what we do is we look up in, in these, in these uh, standard books by Guthrie, or Dr. Woods has this reproduced in his book, the piping factor. So in the piping line, we read off the relevant facts for different, for different units. Okay, so for furnaces, there's only 18%, uh, uh, sorry, 0.18 is due to piping. For heat exchangers, there's a significant amount of piping. There's, there's at least four ports that have been joined to that unit, so that's why the piping factor for heat exchangers are higher. Uh, for vessels, it's 0.61, higher still. For pumps, it's 0.3, and compressors, it's 0.2. So those are, that's where you read your piping factor from. For all these tables on the Uh, they'll be provided when you yeah. Okay, so just a, just a note on this table then again, if we take one unit, so let's take for example shell and tube, what happens is that that first value there is one refers to the base price of the equipment, and then these factors all add up, showing us the breakdown of that 3. Uh, 3.37 multiplier. Is, is how it's made up. Now, in, notice here, this table has, for heat exchangers, the bare module factor is 3.37. Dr. Woods had 3.14 in his book. Okay, so it's just a slightly different source of information. But it's telling us that essentially, that when we go take our base price and multiply it by 3.37 to get the bare module price, well, there's a number of parts that make up that 3.37 factor. And if you sum up all these values in the column, you'll get the 3.37. So piping then is essentially, uh, we can say piping is going to cost 0.46 divided by 3.37. That's the fraction, the percentage then, of what piping is going to cost you within that total bare module operator. Clear so far on that explanation. So let's, uh, let's do another example to help solidify this concept. So, here is, in the notes, uh, another example for you to go try at home. Um, I won't go over this one. This is a unit that's actually in the boiler house here at MAC. You can go estimate the cost for this refrigeration unit, and that's what it looks like. Um, and there's the table that you can read the data from, and the worked out solution is given to you in the slide. So I won't go through that. That's for another example for you to try. But here is a new example I've added to the notes. Um, and I'd like you to take a look at this one and work on the first four steps. So when you estimate the base price of the unit, multiply it for capacity. And then when, if, you, if you're comfortable and confident enough, you can go ahead and estimate the costs for the materials upgrade. So we want to upgrade this pump now so that we use it. It's made from 316 stainless steel clad and for a higher suction pressure. So base unit up here <coughs> is the impeller, the mechanical seal, the coupling, and then the motor. So our pump always has the two components, the motor there in blue, and then our pump itself there. We would like to make the pump from 316 clad stainless steel. So we're just going to take basic carbon steel and clad it with uh, stainless steel. We also would like this pump to be able to withstand and be able to be used for higher suction pressure than otherwise. So we're, we're going to the highest one here on the table. So work through this example, estimate the base price, and then if you're comfortable, and go ahead and estimate the incremental cost for the materials and pressure. So just to give you some context, this shouldn't take you more than five minutes, for example. The midterm, that's two weeks from now, this is something you should be able to do in about five, at most, ten minutes. For the, for the whole question.
which is why I've chosen this example. Let's take a look. Let's say for we know in our company that this unit also needs to be capable of producing uh, or pumping at 20 meters cubed per minute. So if we had that additional information, so Q is 20 meters cubed per minute is the maximum flow rate that this pump needs to also deliver. Is that going to alter the work you've done so far?
Okay, so notice here we're also given the correlation for capacity. We use cube per minute down here, or we're given the correlation power. When you're given two choices like that, you can use either one. Okay, so what the way that these tables are set up is that bear in mind that not every unit correlates with cost in one singular way. So for example, heat exchanges correlate with cost through the area factor. But units like pumps and distillation columns and vessels, they often correlate with cost in more than one way. Okay, so a pump correlates well with cost if we look at it from the horsepower or kilowatts um, factor, but it also correlates well with cost if we look at it from the capacity perspective. Right, so higher horsepower also relates to higher capacity. But which would you choose? Because they're clearly not going to the same amount. Okay, which would you choose? Because they're not the same amount. You could go try it with either one. Okay, so you, we don't have the their module factor here for this, but again, for the for this pump, we could. No, I'm just saying, if you're an exam company and you say, I want a, I want a twinkler or a pump that produces 10 your cube per minute, yeah. but you have both these factors. And one produces a, a much higher cost than the other. But you have, we don't know that, right? So that's my point is to try it out, okay. right? So usually, I, I've just thrown out a, a, a random value here, but usually if you've calculated the kilowatts, you've also know the meters yeah. per hour, and these two will come out to be similar, okay. okay? So what this tells us is that if you're looking for the cost of, the, of something, the first step to do is, before you go decide the size of the unit, actually come look to this table first to see what factor it is about that unit you need to estimate. Do I need to know the flow rate or the power, or in this case, conveniently, I can use either one. Okay, so come to the table first, see which unit you need, or which factor it is about the module that you're trying to estimate, so that you, you're, you're going to trust it correctly after that. The next question. Let's say we're going to use the power, because that's the one that we have and we know, it's 20 kilowatts. Which of these two correlations do we use over here? There's one with an exponent of 0.39, and there's another with an exponent of 0.58. First one. Why? It's the size of the kilowatt is 702. Okay, so what we're saying, we use the first one because the, the, the unit that we're considering is 20 kilowatts and it falls within that range. Is that okay? So 20 kilowatts falls within this range. Notice here it's not 20 divided by 10. Okay, this 10 over here simply refers to the fact that the base pump in the table is a 10 kilowatt pump that costs $920. Okay, that's the only way you use that 10. It's a 10 kilowatt pump is the base pump, then it will cost you $920 back in 1970. To use the range, you simply say unit. This unit is one kilowatt. The one is omitted. Okay, that's the base unit as just kilowatts. My unit is 20 kilowatts, and that's within the range from, two, uh, from 1 to 23. Okay, so the correlation is okay. You might be thinking back to the heat exchanger example, where there was a 100 factor in the denominator there. Let's just go back to the heat exchanger table. And just clarify that quick. The 100, notice, wasn't in the column for the size. The 100 was in the column for the units. Heat exchanges are sized in multiples of 100 meters squared units. Okay? So the units are 100 meters squared. That's why that would appear in the denominator earlier. But this is the price for a 100 meters squared heat exchanger, and it's $8,000. Okay? So that size value will often be different from 1. And so that's how you use it. We only use it, the size, when we're trying to get the cost of the base unit. We don't use it to divide through and calculate the range. <coughs> the next part is, the reason why there's two correlations here is because one leaves off and the other one keeps going. So use this correlation if you're between 1 to 23 kilowatt pumps and then 23 onwards to 250, you use the second correlation. So different exponents 
for the two correlations. So it's more, the, the scaling doesn't use the same exponent. Okay. And then the, the way you use this cost is that for a 100 kilowatt pump, it's going to cost $2,800. If you happen to be in this correlation, your base unit is, uh, is $2,800 for 100 kilowatts. And notice 100 falls somewhere in that range. You'll always find that your base unit over here falls within the given range. Okay, so here a 10 kilowatt pump falls roughly in the middle of that range. A 100 kilowatt pump falls roughly in that range. Yes. We wanted to find It doesn't matter, really. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, you can try either one. But this one will probably come up to be a little bit more money because of that. But yeah, you can imagine there's some error in there. Okay, so the costing then steps one, two, three, and four is fairly straightforward once you've sorted all of those details out. We've checked our correlation. We're using this page 88 from Dr. Woods. It's for pumps. Our base units is in kilowatts. Sorry, the base unit given to us is kilowatts. We're using kilowatts as well. That ratio then is, uh, sorry, the lower bound and upper bound is net. And that means our exponent is 0.39. So to estimate um, our unit, what we first go do is read off the base unit's cost. So remember, the procedure in step three is read off the base unit's cost in the given year. So in 1970, that unit for 10 kilowatts would have cost $920. So our unit, if we're inflating for capacity, would cost 20 over 10 raised to the 0.39 multiplied by the base unit's cost. So we get uh, our, our starting point for the rest of the calculations here then is 1,200. Okay, so that's, our complexity is going to start from this number onwards, 1205. We're now going to inflate that cost for materials using the materials factor of 1.45 and the pressure factor of 1.9. Let's just see where those come from. The materials factor is 1.45 because we're using a stainless steel clad pump. And our pressure factor is 1.9 because we're operating at that high assumption pressure. So that's where those two numbers come from. The 3.3 is the usual bare module factor out there. Okay, so then let's calculate if we naively assumed and just went ahead and took this base pump of 1205 multiplied it by the bare module factor, 3.3, we would get an installation cost as well as the cost of the unit itself. So 1205 plus installing it is 3980. Or take that 3980 and subtract out the cost of the unit, 2775 represents the cost of installation alone. Now, I'm using this term very loosely here, module installation. It's not just installing the unit, it's all those other things of uncrating, ins installing it, um, getting the piping hooked up, and uh, painting, safety checks, supervision, engineering around it. Okay, so that 2775 includes all of those things, but I'm just lumping it up into one term installation. It's what you can see it as, it's the additional cost beyond the 1205 of getting that unit going inside the bare module uh, perimeter. That part should be straightforward from yesterday's class. Now let's look at the next steps where we go and upgrade the unit. So the supplier of the pump is going to take that 1205 and add on the materials factor and the pressure factor and charge us an additional $2,115 to take it to the higher capability. Okay, so multiply by the pressure factor, the materials factor, subtract out the, the base cost of the unit. This 2115 is the incremental cost. So if a vendor supplies you a bill, you'll see the base cost and then there'll be another line below it for the upgraded cost. Okay. So that's, that's that. This next step here, from the green all the way down, is one step. And this is now to estimate the additional cost on our end for the piping. 
So what you could naively assume is if we took the vendor's price, 2115, that's their cost of upgrading the unit, we just went ahead and multiplied that by the bare module factor, you'd think that it would cost us an additional $6,980 to get that unit installed. But that's, that's a, a vast overestimate because the bare module factor includes much, much more than just the pipe. It includes all those other services that we've mentioned earlier. None of those change because we're putting in a more expensive pump. So we shouldn't go multiply by such a large factor. What we do need to do, however, is multiply it by something smaller. And the way we do that is to recognize, let's just extract out the piping portion from that bare module factor. So the bare module factor get the pumps is 3.3. But if we go look at the table, for pumps, the piping factor is only 0.3. So in other words, 0.3 divided by 3.3, 9% of the total bare module costs are only due to piping. Another complication is the fact that not every pipe in the bare module zone needs to be upgraded. We will assume that in this example that only 70% of the piping needs to be upgraded. So then we can calculate our piping upgrade cost as what is the vendor going to upgrade to 115 on their side. We multiply that by the 30% piping factor. The fact we're only using 70% of, of that in our zone and we get an additional 440. So once we have those four items together, we can line them up all up and add up our total costs. So the unit 1205, our um, cost of installing it into the bare module 2775, what the vendor is going to pay on their end and what we're going to pay on our end for the upgrade. Uh, is that F5 value the same for all pumps? Yes, it's, it's pretty much the same for all pumps. Because it's saying for all pumps by and large, 0.3 is <coughs> how much piping is involved inside a typical bare module. So for most pumps, there'll be an inlet and outlet hookup. And and that's it. So the bare module cost in this case, step six now, is 6,540. So what's, we don't need to do this in the, in, the car, in, the, in the procedure, but it's helpful to see is that our base price, 1205, has actually grown to be 5.4 times larger, taking it up to 6,540. So that's a, just useful to calculate, just to get an idea of the magnitude of these jumps. So the last step then is to take this up to today's cost, 6,540. I've used the, the CEPCI index this time to do that. So we take it from 1970, the index was valued at 126. 2011, it was valued at 586. And then lastly, we just, in step eight, we report the upper and lower bounds of the error of 40%. I'm using 40%, notice it wasn't given in the table. So the assumption is 40% is the standard. Okay, it's, uh, it's there in the notes for you to go through a second time. There's another example, as I mentioned, for you to try out for the uh, boiler house, refrigeration unit. But any questions before we, we leave this topic? Okay, I'd like to then just have a short discussion on Some, some final points that we'll have to bear in mind from a practical perspective in the future. What we've done is we've looked at these costs for major units in our flow sheet. So pumps, uh, heat exchangers, so here's a pump, uh, there's a heat exchanger, sorry, a valve over here, um, a, a furnace, reactors, more pumps, there'll be compressors and other flow sheets. But let's recognize that there's a bit more to it than that. So, for example, this furnace, if we estimated its bare module cost, it's a, a, the cost of that unit and then the materials around it. But in most flow sheets, we'll also have surge tanks at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. So those storage tanks will have connections to utilities, additional piping in between the bare modules, and then product storage at the end. So there's, there's oftentimes other units that we also need to take into account. Okay, so so don't just look at your flow sheet and, and just consider the major equipment. Also think of the beginnings, the ends, and these, these uh, connections between units. 
they need to be added as, as well. But for, for many situations, they're very, very small relative to the cost of the units themselves. So we, we, we sometimes just ignore them for uh, preliminary estimates. There is, some, well, there is one cost, though, that is really not negligible, uh, and that's hard to estimate, and that's when it comes to instrumentation. So we've all been or seen at least the control room of most, uh, most facilities, it's very substantial bank of computers and all the instrumentation in the plant is connected up to that and recording that data. So all those computer consoles, those wiring and hookups are phenomenally expensive. The software to run those computer systems are, uh, are not, it's, it's pretty, pretty pricey as well. Okay, so in the hundreds of thousands of dollars for that. So those are additional costs that must be, must be considered. Analyzers, if you put real-time analyzers of the process, gas chromatographs and so forth, um, those costs can add up substantially. Again, just to bear this in mind for the situation where you are in a, in a, in a company that's designing a process from scratch. In many cases, we're not in that situation. We're looking at simple incremental upgrades, so we don't need to consider these costs. But if you are in a situation where you're designing something new, this is going to be a substantial portion of the cost as well. Again, if you're coming to a new process, there's other things. You have to build offices to put your people, your labs, your machine shops, uh, storage and waste treatment outside the facility. You have to consider the cost of, of joining up your, your process to these utilities, uh, building roads around your premises. So again, not, not every one of us will deal with this in the future, but uh, something to consider for a new site. Now I'd like to shift to one section of the costing that's a little different. We've looked at capital costs. These are the units that we buy once and install it, and they stay there for, for a period of time. But there's a whole variety of other costs that also come into our cash flow that we have to account for. And those are monthly costs or, or annual costs that we have to pay. So here's a few of them. We have to pay for our raw materials, for our operators, our engineers, our staff on our site, consumable supplies, and all sorts of utilities. So here's a small list of, of typical utilities, and that list can grow pretty, pretty large for, for larger refineries. We have some other costs that we have to pay no matter what. Taxes to the government for our land, insurance, maintenance, license <coughs> fees, patent fees. And then we have all the other overheads for marketing, R&D, um, and the other people in the company that help make the whole unit a success. So take a look at this graph next and take a minute or two and, and just discuss it with the person next to you and understand particularly why this plot is a line up, why this is a staircase and why that's a flat line. Convince yourself that that's true for those situations.
Okay, so let's take some of the ones down here. Why would uh, sales costs, the overheads due to the corporation, financing costs, research and development, why is that a flat line? So that bottom, the bottom section. Insurance, land taxes. We were paying for the space or for you get a permit for doing whatever you do at that site. If you run however fast versus however much faster, you still have to pay a tax for doing something. Right. So our insurance costs usually are a single dollar figure that you pay, land taxes, administration, overheads, sales. Whether you've shut your plant down for several months and producing nothing, or whether you're operating at 100% capacity, you're paying those costs no matter what. The increasing line at a constant slope. Someone else want to explain that comment? Basically, if you want to produce more, you bring in more materials to get more out of it. So, like, one of more oil, you bring in more oil to the original material so you can produce more. Right, so if we're producing at a higher rate, our materials, those raw materials, costs go up in proportion to that. So it's, a, it's usually a linear increase and we can determine what that slope is from a simple mass balance around our process to determine if I'm increasing production or throughput, say tons per hour, how much is my all my raw materials, my utilities, they're all going to scale linearly or mostly linearly with production. And so that, that plot there is true. We can easily figure that one out. Uh, based on historical operating data. So simply go look back at your company's operations for several years and you can plot several points along that line to determine what that slope is. Labor is a staircase function. Why might that be? So if you want to look at new shape, you have to hire like new, a whole new crew. A whole new crew needs to be hired if you're deciding to ramp up production. You might need an extra shift and then that goes up. Okay, so people have a finite capacity. You can, you can push people a little bit more and get a bit more production out of it, but there comes a point where you have to hire a second person and a third person, and those costs then take a natural staircase. So this makes intuitive sense to us. Let's take a look then at uh, what some of those costs might be. Um, if you go look at various textbooks, so see this textbook, you can see that an operator typically earns around $70,000 a year. Now, if we have one shift where that operator is there, we don't just hire one operator. If we're operating 24-7, we don't hire one operator. We actually need to hire 4.4 operators for that shift. Why 4.4? Because you're going to need to have a spare piece when you get sick or needs time off. There, but he might not be able to be full time if he's on part time hours. Okay, so, uh, so time off if they're sick. Also, like uh, for overtime, if you can minimize overtime. Overtime might be in, included in there. Okay. So that, yeah. If you're on a 24 hour um, system, then you will need shift work, so you'll probably need like an ABC and D crew. ABC crew, ABC D maybe. Uh, so shifts are usually eight hours. So we'll need at least three crews if we're operating 24 seven, but crews overlap, so, so we need to consider that overlapping time, and we consider the time off for vacation and sick time. So the rule of thumb then is, for every one post you have, you need to hire 4.4 people to fill that post. So you need to be, for every post is 70,000 times 4.4 all this required. Are those numbers like including like kind of different things? We'll compact that on there. Is that only for like 24-hour plants, or is it for This would be, a, 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 so the 4.4 multiple is for 24-hour plants. Yeah. Then uh, the rule of thumb is that if for every one, for every four people you have, you need a supervisor, that supervisor is earning 100,000. So it, some companies will have um, more people reporting to a supervisor than four, but typically, Take the number of people here from step A, multiply by 0.25, that's the number of supervisors you need that are being paid by 100,000. Maintenance personnel, maintenance personnel scales more in terms of 
3% of your fixed capital costs. So add all your capital costs on your plant. So the sum of all the units you've purchased, you need to hire people at 3% of that total cost of business, uh, business salaries that you need to be paying for them. And they're being paid typically 75,000. There's engineering and management, so there's, there's, this is this 0.5 factor is probably fairly high, indicating you need two managers for every, uh, sorry, two, one manager for every two people. Uh, some companies that, that can be true. And then the final cost of the salaries is you take all your salaries you're paying A, B, C, and D here, and you add on 40%. So that's the overheads. So for example, here at Mac, what if my salary? When Mac gives it to me, there's all sorts of benefits they pay in addition. The last time I checked, it was around 38% of my paycheck. So 40% is a, is a reasonable number. That So sort of whatever the salary is you're paying all these people, that cost to the company is 1.4 times that salary value you receive. The company is costing them an additional 40% to pay. Maintenance costs of 3% of your fixed capital. Insurance, that's again a fixed number. 1% of the capital, taxes, 2% of the capital. Uh, you have to pay for laboratory staff and consumables, that's 15% of the number of people you've hired over here. There's royalties and overhead. So this table isn't, isn't uh, explicitly what it's always the case. Every company will have slight differences, but if you have no knowledge um, or you're starting up a new, a new site and you're unfamiliar with what the numbers might be, these are good. What do you mean by overhead on personal pay? Okay, so for example, Mac pays me eighty-eight thousand dollars a year for my salary, but the university then also has to pay my pension plan to the government. Uh, sorry, to the pension plan administered by the university. They also have to pay me health benefits. There's all sorts of line items on my salary. All of those add up to be about forty percent. Okay, so. At the end, the university's cost for hiring me is that. So when the university decides to pay hire a new person, that's the amount that it's costing them. It's not costing what they end up paying. Okay, so it's the same deal again. And 40% is a good rule of thumb across the board. There's other costs here that we need to consider. Utility costs, steam, water, electricity, those you can look up. Um, I'm not going to print them in here. There's a whole list of these uh, tables from those textbooks. Then one, one thing when it comes to utility costs is do not consider the crude oil price when you're trying to estimate the cost of, of uh, energy. So, Chemical processes generally are a net consumer of energy, and if we want to estimate the cost, sometimes we, we try to say, well, let's go look at the at the oil price and use that as a surrogate for it. It's not a good estimate because if you plot it over short periods of time and long periods of time, it changes very rapidly. So at best, just use some of those standard values in the tables that I mentioned earlier. And so I, I encourage you actually to go look up what, what those values are. What is the cost of steam? What is the cost of electricity? Those are baseline numbers we should be, should be familiar with. Um, there's not too much new here, other than this is probably an interesting one, maybe more, that if you're considering the price of steam, so many companies are, uh, they consume a huge quantity of steam, and they will produce that steam on site, they will charge themselves an internal rate in the summertime, that uh, that steam is going to cost them zero dollars because there will be an excess of it. But in the winter time, uh, there will be a cost for it that can be significant because that steam required is now used to heat buildings and otherwise gets diverted. So in the summertime, you have an excess steam available, and it might you get these situations where the steam costs uh, cost zero dollars. Other cases that you'll actually sometimes see quite interestingly is the uh, power generation in Ontario can often, you can get negative costs for electricity. So colleagues of mine that work in Buffalo, and they often buy electricity from Ontario at a negative price. So Ontario pays them to take the excess electricity they produce. So, so electric, elect, utility costing is not trivial. It, it fluctuates and many companies actually try to game the system where they will turn on utilities, sorry, turn on equipment at night 
so that it gives costs them not much, much less to reduce than during the daytime when electricity costs more. So it's not an easy number to come with. If you have no idea, you just use an average. But once your company's up and running, uh, look carefully at the utility costs. If they're excessive, there's some, some inventive ways that you can go by to save the money. OK, so where we, where we are now, let's, uh, let's just take a quick recap. We've looked at capital costing for a few days here now. That's the price of all the equipment we're going to purchase and install. Okay, so if we're looking at it back on our timeline, we're deciding to, to implement a project and over a period of time, let's say a year or two, we're going to sink significant capital costs into our process. We purchase several units, bring them to our facility, and then we purchase all our major equipment costs. So here might be a distillation column, a couple of reactors, and other, other uh, pumps and heat exchangers and so forth. And it's taken us this period of time to get those capital costs installed. There's an additional cost here which we call working capital that we sink in. That's called <coughs> capitalists um, and both our initial cost of raw materials. <coughs> then what we're going to start to do is produce product and we're going to start making money and sell it. Now, we not only sell our product, we also have to buy more raw materials. So every day, we're going to be buying and selling, buying and selling. But the net effect is a positive if we're making profits. So we're buying raw materials and utilities, we're selling our product. The net is some positive number. So over a period of time, we should be seeing these increments. And we'll <coughs> Break even, break even at some point in time and start making a profit. Okay, so that's the that's where we've gone <coughs> over the past few days, past few or two in the course. We've learned how to estimate these costs down here for capital items. We also have it's fairly easy to estimate the cost for raw materials and the cost for the product that we're selling. So determining this cash flow trajectory is 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 tedious for sure. It takes a lot of effort to do that, but it's doable. Okay. One thing we haven't considered, and we're going to talk about this in the next time, is we've made a lot of assumptions here. We're assuming that we know these dollar figures fairly accurately. But let's consider the following. Our capital costs have errors of plus or minus 40%. Okay. So this trajectory downwards could have been a whole lot further down, okay, on the worst case. And it could have taken much longer than anticipated to build this plant. So here it took this amount of time to build the process, but what if we had spent more money and taken a longer time to build the process? What if we had miscalculated our income and instead of making this much money every month, we only made half of that? Okay, or what if by some fortunate coincidence, uh, the cost of that product we're selling, uh, we can double the price because of the shortage. Maybe our competitor went out of business and we're now the, one of the only suppliers. We can now charge a bit more for our product. So as you're starting to see here, these cash flow trajectories, this is one particular instance of it. But because we cannot predict the future, we have certain bounds of error that we work with. What we're going to start to do is say, how will this change if other factors change? So what if my raw materials cost more or less? What if my selling price goes up or down? How will my NPV change? That's one of the main things we're interested in. We're interested in what is going to be, over a period of time, my total profit made from an NPV perspective. What is going to be my rate of return, ECFRR? So next class, we're going to see how those factors change as a function of uncertainty in other ways.